than what you guys have. I have no particular, um, you know, information more on the medical stuff. You probably know more about the medical stuff than I do. Okay. But what we do have is we have 3,331 years of dealing with adversity. And I don't think anyone has more street creds than the Jewish people than dealing with challenging situations and how to deal with them and how to stay positive. And I, I personally have been challenged because I know that it is a very serious topic, but I kind of like I'm a joker at heart and I like making light of things. So I try to keep things light, but it's definitely a balance because you don't want to come across insensitive to people's genuine feelings of fear, of concern. And so that's been a little bit of, uh, of the balance about you know, how I've been uh, approaching things to now. So I want to just take, first of all, the structure of tonight. I want to take a few minutes. I'm really curious how this is affecting people, what it's like being alone. Maybe even the scariest thing about this is being alone with your own thoughts, <laughs> right? You can't be with other people. That might be the scariest thing of this whole thing. Who, who am the person that I'm looking at in the mirror? Um, but I would like just a couple minutes, if people are brave enough, we're a very friendly crew over here, even though everyone may not know, oh, yeah, Sarah, everyone's friendly, I see you. I've, what was that game show that, ever, that had all the squares of the stars and everyone was in their own little box? Who remembers that? Hollywood Squares. Hollywood Squares, thank you, Jen. I feel like I'm on a massive Hollywood Squares uh, episode right now, okay. Um, Yo, V, you know what I'm saying? Okay, so it, can I ask for a couple brave volunteers, just what's going on? What's it like? I'm assuming most people are working from home. A couple minutes just to begin the discussion. You can unmute yourself and start talking. I do want to hear from a couple people. If not, then I'll pick some people and put you on the spot. So, uh, all right, brave volunteers, you can unmute yourself. Rabbi Garfinkel. Yeah, Bruce, let's hear it. Well, I want to start with something very unusual. Go ahead. You probably know that I had my seven and a half month pregnant daughter and son-in-law and almost nine months. Um, they were heading back to Israel last Sunday and it's been a, quite a discussion about whether she should or shouldn't go and doctors consulted and all that stuff. Today she received the last visa of a non-citizen Issued in America at 12 o'clock, 11.59 at 12 o'clock, they shut it down. And she is on a flight. Let's hope she can get into Israel. So that was a very stressful week for us. Oh, my gosh. But the nice thing that we feel about it is that I really do believe that Israel is a safe place to be with this, that their medical system is on top of this. As, I, as many people probably have been reading, it could be the the ultimate um, you know medicine that comes is going to come out of israel they seem to be very much on this so we're we're comfortable once she gets there of course she's gonna have to self-quarantine in a one-bedroom apartment that she'll have to figure that one out but it's been quite interesting at the leon household the last couple of days oh my gosh wow that's a big decision to go back to israel and, and as you're saying bruce it could even be that that's a safer place Incredible. By the way, loving parents that they're willing to send their children and grandchildren back and not just keep them there. So good for you, Bruce. Well, your mother's on the phone, so I'm sure she agrees. <laughs> that by Garfinkel, once they get to be a certain age, they get to make their own decisions. Isn't that the way it is? Okay, not until well, until you've paid all the bills of the wedding. Okay, fine. I still have control. After I've paid the well, the bills of the wedding. I want to know, Mrs. Own. Garfinkel, if she had any say in, in the, the rabbinical decision of her son or not. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Okay, Bruce, right, thank good. you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. All right, anyone else? Thoughts? I just want to say that um, it, hey, is Rabbi so, Johnny. How are it is you? so it is so nice to see Rabbi Garfinkel. <laughs> My, I, I get such a chizik just seeing you, Rabbi. And... Um, it's such a crazy, crazy time right now. And um, I Johnny, feel like every... Give us, give us a quick rundown of what's going on in Houston. Give us 30 okay. seconds on Houston. So, so, so you know that song, dun, 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 another one bites the dust. Okay? Yes. So yes. Every, every day in the last week, a new Houston synagogue has been closing down. And the synagogue that I find myself in right now, okay, take a look. Um, this is Congregation Beit Rambam. This is the primary Sephardic synagogue of 
of Houston. Wow. We just had we just had barely a million. This place is normally full. People are afraid now, and um, we are the last man standing. We are literally the last synagogue that is open in the entire Houston. Rabbi Masri, this is, he's a not he's not a very emotional uh, guy, and this is the first time in seven years of working under him that I felt him choke up. I, I was just schmoozing with him right now after davening, and I've never seen that emotional side to him. And I think when you're the rabbi of a synagogue, your life becomes your, your people. Your life becomes your synagogue, your community. And when you're slowly seeing the pieces crumble and you're seeing every synagogue fall down, you have a harder and harder time justifying staying open, even if halakhically and scientifically. Well, Johnny, we just lost you. Okay, I think what Rabbi Johnny was saying is that, it, and, and I've seen this with the rabbis of our synagogues here, is that it's very emotional to be able to close your synagogue. You know, uh, the Broners and Leons can attest, Rabbi Gross, our, our leader of our synagogue, I speak with him, is a very emotional thing. You put your heart and soul in it, and it's very eerie to walk the streets, and the synagogues literally shuttered. And it is a bizarre thing. Everyone's praying in their homes, and it... it it may be hard to relate, but the synagogue is a place that people go two, three, sometimes even four times a day. Certainly on this Shabbos is going to be crazy with all the synagogues closed. Um, kids playing together. Again, we're more in the, the family, you know, zone, neighbors. It's not really clear that neighbors' kids can play with each other at all. Uh, the high schools have chesed kindness programs where they go and they help other families. And to be honest, those were canceled. I mean, really the whole inner connection is being shut down. So in, in the, in the you know, Orthodox Jewish community, there's a lot of it that happens every day. So it's very palpable. All right, I wanna hear from some, uh, a couple young professionals downtown or wherever you are. I can share. What's it like? Sarah, go ahead, yeah. Well, it's just um, from a teacher's perspective, I just started um, teaching, I started Monday teaching online. So we've been using a platform similar to this, but um, it's Google Meets, and I teach choir, and so I have, um, I have classes of like 40 kids all online <laughs> trying to work together. Um, surprisingly, when I ask them to mute themselves, they do, so I don't have to force, force mute them, but if only, have, if only we had that button in class. But um, we, yeah, we're making it work, and it's just interesting seeing how the education world is really coming together like every community that I was talking with somebody today that you know a lot of times when big things happen in the world there are the people who are affected and then there are the people who aren't affected that are sending their thoughts and prayers and this is truly a unique event where literally everyone on earth is affected in some way or multiple ways I mean my mom is out of the country right now and we're not sure if she's going to make it back and I have friends who know people who are ill from this and people who are trying to work from home for the first time ever and um, it's truly, truly affecting everybody. So it's just, it's, it's, um, it's very um, comforting to be able to, you know, sit with yourself and, and count what you're grateful for and, and acknowledge the things that we do have and take a step back because we take for granted that, you know, we think we're in control all the time and suddenly we're really not and we realize that we're not. So it's finding ways to connect in ways that aren't necessarily physical, but um, people reaching out to check in if you're okay, right. things like that. And you, know, and you know, Sarah, that's one of the things we were talking about, you know, who's in control of what? And it, it's, a, it's a big question. And I think that's one of the real questions that people need to ask, you know, who's in control? We think right. we're in control all the time. And this is, a, this is like the, you know, the blip on the screen. It could be that really this is the regular default setting that Hashem is sort of revealing to us. Right, well, right. So, all time. and that's actually David Began was saying this, and he was sharing his thoughts. He said, you know, he runs this big Lachaim Center like a shul, and he was davening for, by himself for the first time in a long time, and he found himself initially davening to, like, ask Hashem just return the world back to normal. But then he's like, wait, no, that's not what we want. Obviously, there's a, there's a greater purpose for all this, and looking into how we can elevate the world rather than go back to where we were because obviously things weren't working so great. <laughs> yeah, it's an opportunity. And, and this is a theme I want to I wanna get out in some of my posts, a, a couple of the videos so far. We have more videos coming along the way. Uh, but if the only thing we get from this is uh, to stock up on hand sanitizer and toilet paper, then we've missed an opportunity. <laughs> God bless hand sanitizer and lots of toilet paper. I'm all in favor. Yay. But if our experience with this 
experience this coronavirus stops at that, then unfortunately, I think we've missed an opportunity. There's a, there's a big opportunity here in terms of us thinking about who we are, what's going on in life, etc. Okay, Sarah, toda raba. Okay, thank you. Yes, thumbs up. Other beautiful young professionals somewhere, Chicago, elsewhere, tell us a little bit about what's going on with your life. Or I will call on you. I see who you are. Uh, uh, hi, Ami. Uh, good to see you. Raquel's here. Trish's here. Yeah, I still know who y'all is. All right, you know what? I'm going to have to do it. So, Megan, I want to hear about the corporate lawyer downtown. I okay. Think I think that there's just a, like, a lot first of uncertainty. Of all, first of all, down. introduce yourself. You are Megan. Hi. Hi, I'm Megan. Um, I'm an attorney in downtown Chicago, so, and I'm a first year. So I think that there's just like a lot of uncertainty right now. Um, I'm a first year associate, so I think that like just in terms of job security too, I think that that's kind of freaky. Um, just because things are still busy now, and but I do like I do mergers and acquisitions, so that's kind of something that's not a priority when things are going not so well in the economy. Um, so I think it's just kind of important to think of like the bigger picture though, that it's not just about like working and, and everything at times like this, because it can get a little overwhelming. Right. Is there a genuine fear on the street of, again, I'm not talking about necessarily, you know, the, the obviously waiters and people in the service industry are very concerned, rightfully so, about job security, et cetera. But let's talk about just for a second, the corporate world. Um, what you are in a, you know, big law firm, you Penn grad, by the way, Megan's an unbelievable soccer player as well. So watch out. Okay. Four years of Penn varsity soccer. Okay. Megan, you know, we really bonded that I broke my foot over playing soccer. She wanted to know every nitty gritty of how I broke my foot in soccer. And that was our first real bonding experience. Uh, still in physical therapy. Thank you very much, Megan. All right. But Megan, do you, is there real, do you think that there's a fear across the board in terms of job security now in the corporate world? Um, I don't think yet. I think people are still kind of in denial that like everything's kind of happening. Um, because if you think about it, it's just things have changed so much in the last week. I mean, last week I was in the office and some of the head partners were thinking that it was still like a cold that was going around. Um, so I think that and you didn't see businesses closed yet, um, restaurants were open, things like that. So I think things were still going on to be like, things were still somewhat normal. Um, I think that in, it's just hard to predict though, uh, because you saw in one week, you saw things being fully open to completely closed. As some cities, like you can't, I think you can't leave your house yet. So I like, I guess, I, it's kind of people are trying to be positive and be optimistic, but I think that it's kind of like looming in the background, kind of like the reality of the situation. It's starting right. to hit. So I, I think how that, long, right. yeah, exactly. The how long thing we had, a we had a meeting with like the head partner today and he had no idea how long things were going to be closed. And I think that like, that's kind of telling. It could be like, I know Penn already canceled graduation. So that's in May. So I think that, that's just a huge factor that we just don't know, like how long can this last? And I think even if it doesn't last long, I think it will have lasting impacts on the corporate world. Like I think you'll see like a huge shift to like working from home. Um, I think that will be like a big thing going forward as right. people adjust, but it, it's kind of still like uncertain. Un amazing. Megan, thank you. Can we switch? I want to pivot to academia and put our cancer research PhD, postdoc PhD from Northwestern, Michelle, MIT, Michelle, please, could you tell us what's going on in the world of academia and how this has impacted? You're talking about universities closing. I assume Northwestern is closed. Is your lab closed? No, and this is kind of where it's actually kind of divided my lab. I so can't hear you so well, Michelle. Can you boost up your... Better, can you all hear me? Yeah, better, that's better. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so Northwestern is not closed, which is actually a lot of... Yeah, it's, people have been very polarized on this because we currently have five confirmed cases and many people feel we should and many people feel we shouldn't because we do meaningful research and people are not, if they're not sick, they should be able to work. It's, I don't want to get into like all the politics of that 
but I will say it's been really stressful. Um, and from meaning like classes are classes happening. Are classes are canceled. They're all on online or they're 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 ending for the undergrads this week, and all classes are online. So it's still functional. So the department, at least my department, has made the decision to keep working if people want to work and feel comfortable and they're keeping it very ambiguous as oh if you feel safe if you feel healthy you can come in but there's no pressure but if you want to the options there so it's it's this back and forth and i've kind of been going in every day assuming that what if this is my last day what if tomorrow the governor says close all universities and then i have to end all my i mean he Wow. Wow. It's, yeah. it's remarkable. I'm actually shocked. I was shocked elections went off yesterday in Illinois. That was a big shock for me. And I mean, you, Michelle, you do experiments that are time sensitive, you know, in the middle of your experiments. I mean, you know, this is uh, obviously they're working on the coronavirus, you know, vaccine and everything. But you say that because I was told by my boss the other day to write up what we call a white paper. It's like a two page document that we use to apply for grants. And so my lab is putting in a, we're gonna probably send it to the Air Force and the military uh, funding sources. So there's a, actually a chance that my lab might work on coronavirus in the next year, um, should this get funded. But okay. honestly, Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. Project 613, cutting, uh, nope. breaking news. I think Israel will come, I think Israel's vaccine will hit the ground a lot faster than anything that comes out of my lab. No offense to my boss. <laughs> well, also, Israel already brought into the country strains of the coronavirus in order to start investigating it. Like they have already eight medications that they're testing around, and like they're trying to extract vaccines. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> Natalie. But so, mm -hmm. so the race is on for the vaccine. I have to tell you, and maybe Sarah allude, alluded this to before. Again, if you're, not, I hear some typing. I don't know if someone can uh, mute before when they're okay. But. Uh, you know, Sarah's like mentioned Rabbi Began, who said that, you know, I just want this to go back to what it was before. You know, on a certain level, yes, we want everyone to be safe. But as soon as that vaccine comes out and everyone's safe, that's it. No one's going to think about their lives anymore. No one's going to be introspective. Everyone's going back to the NBA. By the way, I knew this was not normal by one thing happening. NBA canceling their season. That was it. I'm like, whoa. We just went exponential. This is not normal. NCAA going without fans initially, but still holding the tournament. That was like, okay, you know, they're hedging. NBA canceling their season or suspending it. That was like unbelievable. I think from then they did more than any government <laughs> to raise the awareness of, of this. Okay. Um, all right. Just put out there, if there's one more person, then I want to get to some Jewish sources and a little bit of a Jewish approach and the, uh, 14 minutes we have left, and I still want to leave it more for more discussion. Again, a big part of this is really to be there for our community and to schmooze, to see people, um, you know, and and to connect as well. Hi, Phoebe. I didn't welcome you. I didn't see you. There's I have so many screens over here. Raquel, hello. Marty, hi. A three one two number. I don't know who else did I not shout out to. Okay, so if I missed anyone saying hello to, uh, please forgive me. Uh, Gennady, you see, I'm... Rabbi Garfinkel, if you don't take care of Zoom, Zoom take care, takes care of you. See you. <laughs> a little bit of things intensified a little bit. But uh, yeah, all of these things are interesting and frightening at the same time. But uh, at the same point, I think it's a great opportunity for us to connect, to learn, to find new ways of thriving in this environment. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll become and Jonas, you really can thrive in this environment because you're one of the businesses that actually is killing it right now, which is mortgages. So a little bit of an <laughs> economic tip, okay? If you own any property, work on a remortgage now because it really, even if you just did it, okay? Yeah, and you're right. It's, 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 it's really big right now. But the thing is that we have to take a look at the bigger picture. If people won't have sources to pay for their mortgages. I don't have to tell you what's going on. That is uh, sure. Yeah, and the overall picture, it's it's not fun, but it, we have to use it as an opportunity. I mean, right. Jewish people are still here. It's, you know, 
it was impossible and we're going to show what's going on. I hope Israel will be really make that vaccine. We're, we're waiting for it. Yeah, I, I think it would be great. I, and I'm waiting for all the BDS people that's boycott, divestment, and sanction people who do not use or try not to use products from Israel. I'm waiting for that vaccine to come out and them not to use it. I'm waiting for that one to come out. That's that's what I'm like. Go Israel, go Israel. You know. Oh, yeah, waiting for everyone to start. You don't want to use it. Jews in there. <laughs> okay. All right. So I want to pivot. I want to pit, first of all, thank you all for your participation. And uh, I think we have a good sense. We're also in it together. I want to pivot and just talk a little bit about some Jewish sources here. Okay. Uh, the first thing I think it's really crucial is that if you look at the world that will, the tendency is to panic. Okay. There's really two approaches to life. It comes from the Purim story, the Haman approach and the Mordechai and the Esther approach. The Haman approach was Amalek, which is an ancient Darth Vader of history, which basically says there's no rhyme and there's no reason. It's all luck, it's all chance, and there's nothing really, uh, there's no method to the madness, and life is totally random, okay? Now, unfortunately, if you hold of that opinion, then when a coronavirus comes around, everything is scary. You're free falling. There's no purpose. There's no plan. At any moment, this virus, which has a life of its own, could come and, and get you. You have mass hysteria, okay? Now, the Jewish people are d directly opposed to that ide ideology, and that comes from, obviously, our belief that Hashem created the world, and he runs the world. And it's not just that he ran the world and he wound up the clock and waved it goodbye that Hashem is ultimately totally intimately involved with every aspect of the life, globally, nationally, and personally. Every aspect and layer of life, the Almighty is inextricably linked up with and in control of. Now, if you go down that path, then it's okay. It's scary. We don't know what's going on. There's definitely uncertainty, and, and it could be even objectively challenging. I might have lost money. I might be losing clients. I, I might even, God forbid, be sick or lose people who are close to me. There are lots of very scary things that can happen. Okay, We're not whitewashing anything. But when that does happen, we have a way to deal with it that there is a plan, there's a planner. There's a master of the universe who has a divine plan. And if anything happens in our life, okay, we believe fundamentally, not only is it okay, but it is good. And it has a good and positive purpose. Now, this is a, like the ABCs of, of Torah thought. The ABCs of Torah thought. In fact, there is a, um, a famous state, a famous rabbi in the Talmud who's called Rav Nachum Ish Gamzu. And gamzu in Hebrew means gamzu litova, which means this also so good. Whatever this, this rabbi had the most bitter life in terms of everything that happened to him. But you know what? He was not bitter. He was a positive, totally. He would had diseases and things and poverty and starvation and everything new thing that would happen to him. He would say gamzu litova. It's also good. So he was literally known as this also. Rabbi, this also. This also is for the good. Okay, and um, that's obviously an extreme example of this, of our approach, but that really is a fundamentally a, a, uh, a Jewish approach. And then now the next question becomes, if we have a good God and everything's for our good, then why are there viruses in the world that are scary? What's going on over here? This is like, you know, uh, you know God is not, uh, you know, the Wizard of Oz behind curtain number three, who is sadistically toying with people, right? And fundamentally, the, the, the approach we, we, we have is uh, really brought down codified, but many years before that, but by Ramosha Khan Lutzata, those people who were on our Israel trip, we were at his grave um, in Tiberias, overlooking the Lake Kinneret, and it was right next to Rabbi Akiva's grave, and he wrote a book called Der Hashem, and that whole book basically was summarized in the first part of the Mesil Susharim, The Path of the Just. And The Path of the Just says quite simply that People just don't understand the nature of this world. The nature of this world is not the next world, okay? I don't know about anyone out there. Um, I'm very grateful for my Jewish upbringing and my background. There is one thing that if, 
<laughs> now, again, not bashing. I'm just telling you my experience. Non-Orthodox teachings, they do not teach about the next world. They say that, oh, it's all about this world. You really cannot understand the next world without this world. Uh, sorry, this world without the next world. This world is a world. The analogy that rabbis would like to give is one of the workout room, okay? You have the workout room, and then you have the schwitz. You have the spa, okay? And uh, just imagine one day you're coming in. You know, I had a difficult day at work, assuming you could go to work. And you say, you know what? I'm going to skip the workout, and I'm going to go straight to the sun. I'm going to go straight to the jacuzzi. I'm just going to treat myself today. And then out of force of habit, you know how force of habit, you drive to your parents' home, right? And you should be driving your own home, whatever your force of habit. Out of force of habit, you go to the weight room and you start pumping weights and you're confused. Like, wait a minute, why is this so painful? I wanted to go to the Schwitz. I wanted to go to the sauna. I wanted to go to the bat, you know, the, the jacuzzi. And here I am lifting. That feeling of disappointment and pain is much of the pain and angst that people feel in this world because they don't have proper expectations of what the nature of this world is. The nature of this world is, as the Mesil Sharm says, the Ramchal says, is that it's one of challenge, of tests, of really overcoming resistance. Now, by the way, I want you to know, this is not a depressing view of this world. There are tremendous joy in this world. The joy in this world is whenever you've pushed yourself, if you've been an athlete or, um, in push your limits emotionally in any way that feeling of like I, it's easier just in sports because it's the physical parallels the spiritual world but that last minute of, of of soccer practice or basketball practice or or a workout in a gym where your lungs are burning and your muscles are aching and that last repetition and you make it that feeling of joy that's the joy of this world it's overcoming challenge and when we overcome that challenge that's when we become great that's when we become truly, truly great. That is um, the purpose of this world. And then guess what? After we've earned that greatness, as an additional bonus, we get an entire world of bliss for all of eternity. That's how the Almighty set up this world. So it could be that the scorecard at the end of this world will be that there will be righteous people who have suffered, okay? But in the end, they've gained so much goodness and have extracted so much potential and become so great that that was the purpose of this world. So this does not mean that viruses aren't scary. They are very scary, but there's a purpose to them. And I think that's what I was saying earlier about using this opportunity to reflect, who are we? What is my purpose in this world? What am I doing here? This is a challenge. Anyone who tells you this is not a challenge is literally missing the boat. It is a challenge. And even if you're not affected, let's say you have a good job and you have food on the table and you have plenty of toilet paper and hand sanitizer galore and everything's great. The entire world has an opportunity right now to really tap into and to think about who I am, what am I doing on planet earth and how am I going to become a better person? Okay. So I would say that's really step one of this, I would call the opportunity of the coronavirus. Okay. And so I'm going to say one more piece and then we'll open it up. And then those people want to pop off. That's fine. Those people want to stay on. I'm, I'm totally cool. Cause I, again, want to be to honor the time. Okay. The next question is, you know, so why is this happening? Why is this happening? Okay. It's a test. Okay, great. So what type of test is this? So I will tell you that according to Jewish sources, we know a hundred percent the answer to the question of why did God send this? 100%. You know what the answer is? We 100% do not know why God did this. Okay, but there's a trick here. What motivates God? We absolutely do not know. We do not know what motivates him. However, um, and I guess the best way to express this is when Queen Esther, when she was in the darkness of her pain and agony, it's recorded in the Psalms that she says, Kedi, Kedi, Lama Azaftani, my God, my God, why have you abandoned us? And the Talmud in Meseches Megillah says, you know what? She wasn't asking God, why did you abandon us? She was asking a different question because she knew the ultimate answer is that it was beyond me. But the word Lama can also be vowelized as Lema. You know, we have some Israelis here, Natalie. Uh, what is a Lema in English? 
Do you know? For what? For what? She wasn't asking why are you doing this, God? Because ultimately God has his zillions of calculations. But the question she wanted is, Le ma, God, for what purpose are you doing this? And that's the question that we need to ask. For what purpose, God, are you putting the world through this coronavirus craziness, turning the world over? That is where our work as Jews begins. For what purpose? Okay. So I want to throw out just a couple of ideas, possibilities. Could be controversial, could not be. But I'm going to throw some lemas out there. For what purpose? You know, we know that Hashem interacts with us measure for measure. That's how he does it. You know, so... If we're mean to others, God pays that back to us by others being mean to us. Okay, that's that's a general, people call it karma, call it whatever you want, but you reap what you sow, okay? I can't, like, imagine this world literally, if not fully quarantined, a level of quarantine, everyone's separated. Everyone is in their own room, okay? Or everyone is not connecting like we normally do. I, the first thing that hit me, this whole thing is, you know, the Thanksgiving dinners where people in the same family have different political views, okay? And they can't talk to each other or they're upset at each other. Or families are, you know, one's wearing a MAGA hat and the other's wearing a, you know, uh, impeach Trump. And, you know, and again, there's not, no politics tonight, none, none, none. But the point is I'm giving an example of the vitriol, the, the, the venom of which people are talking about politics. They, We've developed such a separation among us. Shem's like, oh, oh, you, you're separating yourselves. You're taking politics and the, the issues of the day so seriously that you're breaking love, loving, familial, and close friend relationships. Oh, you're isolating yourselves? Well, let me show you. Wink, wink. Let me show you what isolation really looks like. Okay, and by the way, I don't think it's an accident that this is right ramping up in the presidential election, okay? Because whatever division we have seen now, and the, what we say in Hebrew, agmat nefesh, the, the pain and the ugh, the uchness, um, it's only going to get worse. So, and I, I will just put this out there. I know people, different people post different things. I said, if people, the only thing that they get out of this is toilet paper and hand sanitizer, they've missed the point. If the only thing people get out there, out of this experience, is either to blame Trump or to praise Trump or to be a mouthpiece for your political views, you miss the whole thing. You miss the whole thing. Because Hashem is telling us, you know what? I'm in control <laughs> over here. I'm the one who's, 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 who's running the world over here. And it doesn't matter how good your economy is. It doesn't matter how good your policies are. In about a space of a month, I'm going to take this nanometer thing that no one can even see and i'm going to turn the world's markets around and i'm going to close everyone's borders and i'm going to divide everyone up and i i personally think that if we can take out of this again there's just one of the ideas and obviously there's more that if we can have and work towards a more civil discussion with other people and love people that we disagree with you know we're the people by the way we taught the world, love your neighbors yourself. That was not the ancient Greeks. It was certainly not the ancient Romans who had no regard for human life even. We are the ones who have been the beacon of this idea that we got to love your fellow person. Okay? And I think it could be, again, we're not saying why God did this. We don't know why. But what can we take from this? I think if we would take that type of thing that, okay, I may disagree with someone on political or other issues, but it does not mean that I need to uh, disengage from that relationship, okay? So that is a little bit of the background in terms of one of the things, there are many others. I want to open up the mic to, um, that'll be the official, I guess, Torah section of, of, the, of the evening's discussion, and if there are any thoughts or other things, I, I know there's a lot going on in the chat here that I haven't been seeing over here if people have comments. Um, okay, all right, no, we're good. All right, so if anyone thoughts on what is going on, thoughts on either that idea or any other possible ideas of things that we can learn from this experience or things that you've been thinking about how you want to take a lesson from this whole experience.
Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Rabbi Garfinkel? Yeah, Bruce, what are you thinking? I'm not allowed to speak twice, but I have to give I have to give the senior citizens comment to your young professionals, okay? Please do. We're ready. Um, uh, first of all, I appreciate everything you said. It actually gave me a lot of chizik. You know, I have a company with 130 employees. I understand people's fear of where things are going. I have 400 clients that I'm trying to manage HR questions and EAP questions that are overflowing right now with all kinds of issues from wow. sick time to pay time off. There's a lot of, lot of stress out there. I want to say this one thing to the young professionals from a business perspective, having lived through four things like 9-11 and the meltdown of IT and the, and the financial. Um, for I think it was Jessica who was the partner in the law firm. Megan, Megan. Megan, Megan, Megan this is for you because I'm involved in a merger acquisition deal myself. So I, I can tell you that, you know, it, it gets magnified as you get older. You can imagine your senior partners, uh, when their 401k is halved, it's a, it's a lot more money than the 28 year olds. <laughs> okay, this, this will be a big opportunity for you young professionals. I'm just telling you that to keep calm, keep your heads on because after every one of these things, um, new things come about and it's new opportunities. So after the Chicago fire wiped out 95% of the city, the city boomed for 10 years and it was a great opportunity for people to help rebuild. There will be eventually a day when we're gonna rebuild this thing. It's gonna be harder for older people to sort of make up what's been lost, but for younger people, I think it's gonna be a great opportunity. So don't get too lost in the, in the moment because these things do provide opportunity and anybody will tell you that some of the greatest companies were, came out of the Great Depression. So keep your wits about you, keep thinking about how you're gonna make yourself more useful. And then this next piece is for everybody. And I'm talking to myself. Bruce, my daughter, one second. Sh shift. Yeah, we we'll see your face. Now okay. we we'll see your face. Go my, ahead. My daughter's a nurse at, at Northwestern. And she gave me a lot of, because I actually, as a concerned parent, you know, uh, knowing that there's a number of coronavirus patients on her floor, um, you know, I was like, maybe you shouldn't go to work, right? And she said, Dad, I'm a healthcare worker. Why doesn't everybody stop thinking about themselves and start thinking about other people? And I started thinking to myself, you know what? And I, it took that to heart. I actually called almost every employee today just to say, how are you doing? Are you okay? I think if we shift our focus to thinking about how other people are doing it, it actually will make us less nervous about ourselves. And truthfully, that's the way we Jews can get through this thing. If you talk about the Purim story, it's when the Jews all came together and fasted together and showed unity not the dispersed nation that was not together, but the, so maybe I'm just using this from Raina, but it really helped me out today, was every time we think about our own 401k or if Rabbi Garfinkel says, I hope my donors can make, can make their payments so I can you know, keep 613 flying high, or Johnny's worried about oil prices in Houston, we all got those concerns, but if we just ship them to like what the other guy's going through, right. I think that will make us feel a little bit more happy and it'll actually, be a practical way we can get something out of this, not to dim diminish all the stuff you said, because you gave me great physics with your right. words today. Very there helpful. Are many things. But I think there is a thing that we all just think about somebody else for a second. And, uh, and actually, you know, think about it. When you hear that somebody might have coronavirus, your first reaction is, oh, you know, like I'm gonna stay as far away from that person as possible. Maybe bake a cake for that person or send a nice note to them, you know, or call them or something, you know what I mean? So. Amazing. I think that's the time for us to really uh, think about others also. You know, Bruce, amazing. I, on the, um, some of you might know there's a, a rabbi WhatsApp chat. Um, and boy, oh boy, it has been going hot and heavy on these subjects. One of the rabbis posted that the entire city of Beit Shemesh, okay, which is a, what we would call a suburb of Jerusalem, which is a, a pretty significant city for Israel's size of itself, um, tomorrow night, Thursday night, I believe around 8 p.m., um, the government and uh, has encouraged everyone um, to go on their balconies, to go in their courtyards, and to clap and cheer for two straight minutes for all of the healthcare workers who um, are putting themselves on the line, like in the theme of what Raina, Bruce's daughter, w was talking about. So um, I guarantee 
Well, I don't guarantee anything. I almost guarantee you will see some amazing videos coming from that, a very special thing uh, in terms of you know giving to others. There have been a lot of heartwarming stories about people stepping up to the plate and um, really so, going out for, for the next person. Okay, great. Rabbi, if, if I could interrupt. Hi. It's John uh, Danzig from New York. <laughs> uh, there's a, I just put, yeah, put it in exile. I put in the chat uh, the first Israeli patient who had uh, you made you made me think of this the first patient he was now he had coronavirus and he's now recovered uh, I, there's there's a video of like him being interviewed and I'm not gonna give it away it's pretty great uh, if you want to share your, if you want to play it with shared screen uh, um, I, I only have one issue is that but, I have certain because of work things I have certain things oh, okay don't worry about computer. it then. but yeah but like everyone go to that chat and uh yeah his reaction his reaction to coming out is okay but everyone if you look in the chat there's a there's a, a John Danzig to everyone over there yeah you can see that that I think I saw that so I'm not going to give it away but if people want to open up a, a new tab and, and watch that that's it's very impressive thank you John for sharing Okay. Um, a question? Yes, Michelle. So, I mean, not to like look too far ahead, but you know me, I'm very type A. Um, what does this mean for how we celebrate Passover and how we prepare? And I mean, like, so the reason I say this is because actually I was talking to my grandmother the other day. I called both of them and thank God they're both okay right now. Um, but my grandmother was like, yeah, I got to go get my matzah now. And I was like, oh, like, so I actually went and like stocked up now on matzah and like cakes, but like, what does this mean for seders and like, how do we prepare for that? Okay, Michelle, I'm so, I was not gonna bring that up at all, but I'm so glad that you did. I'd say like this, first of all, you should know within um, a lot, it's become Passover for many Jews, certainly in the Orthodox world, but even in the non-Orthodox world has become vacation week. And um, a huge industry of going away for hotels, you're talking about thousands and thousands of uh, Jews and families. And like, you know, the grandparents who got the dough, they bring all their children and grandchildren in, like, you know, to a hotel because who's going to cook for all of them? And there's a lot of people who literally don't have plans or had to cancel their plans. So ironically, in West Rogers Park, just to tell you, there have been meat suppliers, who kosher meat suppliers who've opened their you know, industrial size warehouse to, to deal with the demand of literally probably an extra thousand or 2000 people in Chicago celebrating that, that usually were our way. So there's a lot of plans that are just been totally, you know, upended. In terms of our lives, I think this is some of the themes that we heard earlier on the talk is that, um, you know, nothing gets in the way of us serving the almighty. We, you know, the, the synagogues are closed. We're praying by ourselves. It's a very painful experience. You know, I think I'm going to feel it most on Shabbos. You know, Shabbos, you guys have come to the hood. You've been here for Shabbos. You see it, Shari Tzedek, in the mornings. There's, you know, 150, 200 people there. It's vibrant. It's good. It's action. And literally, it's going to be a ghost town. Everyone's going to be praying in their own houses. I, I, it's going to be mind-boggling. But you know what? We're still going to be praying. Because the Almighty says, you know what, praying together as a group, that's, that's a kindness I'm giving you. I'm not giving it to you now, but you're still going to go ahead. So the same theme, I would say, Michelle, with Passover is we're going to go on. There's nothing that's going to stop us. If there were Jews who literally in the camps kept Passover and didn't eat their one morsel of bread for a week because they're keeping Passover there, we're going to keep Passover here. So that's the, that's the basic answer. But now the question is, there's a lot of questions that come up that are very practical. Let's say you have elderly relatives who live by themselves. I'll give you an example. My mother-in-law comes to us every Passover and, and Suri and I are, are talking about, obviously we want her to come, but that means getting on a plane and that means coming here, which means exposing her and she's in her seventies. And the answer is we don't know what the right thing is. We can't bring 10 people there for technical and other reasons. And so, there's going to be a lot of questions. This is, by the way, why we have rabbis. The rabbis are literally over inundated with all these questions, and we have to work through it. You have to balance health and safety, but also emotional things. You know, it could be worth it for someone to take the risk if they're going to be by themselves with Passover. Um, so um, the other question comes up with hosting. 
You know us on Passover. We usually host a ton of people. We never, you know, no Jew left behind. We want every Jew to be there. And all of a sudden it dawned to me today, you know, bottom line is we're going to take care of our students. Everyone's got a place. How do we do it? Do we break it up? Do we, <laughs> whatever it is, we're always here for you guys. You're always going to have a place for Pesach, bottom line. But is it safer to break it up in seders of five guests in different places? Is it, you know, we usually have 25, 30 people for, for seders. So these are questions we have not worked out. Um, there has to be a balance of common sense, of medical approach, but also that Jewish heart. So where that next is going to be, I don't know. I do think technically, practically, good call. Buy your matzah now. <laughs> It's like voting in Chicago early and often. Buy your matzah now. Get some extra boxes. Um, and, and, and we need to be prepared. Absolutely. So a uh, lot of questions going on. But the basic approach, I would say, is nothing's going to stop us. We're going forward. How that exactly is going to look, each person we have to figure out on our own. Thank you, Thank you for asking. Okay. Great. All right. Nine o'clock. I, I don't want to overwear our welcome. I just have such good vibes on the call. Welcome to Stephen Sable. Love you, Stephen. Thank you for joining us all the way from San Diego. Okay. World traveler. Stephen, has this uh, affected even your world travel? It, it has. Okay. By the My way, for, for this to affect Stephen Sable, gold, triple platinum in every airline. Okay. World traveler, Stephen. Give us 30 seconds on, on the impact on your life. Well, 30 seconds on the impact of my life. It's just, it's just a bit strange, to be honest. I, I mean, I've still been traveling. I was in Vegas two weeks ago. I was in Arizona this past week. I just came back on uh, Monday. But let me tell you, just from when I went to Arizona on Thursday till I got back on Monday, the panic kind of grew exponentially each day. And it was just, it was just very awkward. So I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, go with the flow kind of guy and, and the, the uh, anxiety in the area is just getting up there. Right. In California, California is a, a, I mean, I know Illinois, you guys just doubled the cases overnight or something, but uh, California is pretty high in cases too. So it's just a very uncomfortable place. But I will tell you yeah. that, um, you know, California is famous for traffic and that hasn't been the case lately. <laughs> so I have really been enjoying just hitting the road. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My commute to work has dropped so much and it's, it's really wonderful. You know, Stephen, we had a dentist appointment. We got like the last dentist appointment for closing day for two of our daughters and literally... Um, a, a drive that could have taken 25 minutes, 25 minutes, 15 minutes. We're there on time. Props. Yeah, and I'll tell you, the, the Zoom, this is my first time downloading Zoom, and, and I was late to this call because there was another kind of Jewish thing going on, and it's kind of neat because there's all these organizations around the, around the world that I've met in my worldly travels that do these local programs that I can never participate in because I'm not local but now kind of everything's going digital it's kind of fun so uh yeah and, and you know that. Stephen, i'm glad you mentioned that and maybe we'll uh last couple of comments because again i want to be sensitive time those people want to stay on and and schmooze we're, we want to be a, a vehicle to you know a, com a community um you know we really this is where the rabbis and i spoke with Rabbi marcus at length of this in curia this is where we have to step up you know, you listen to the political commentators and, you know, what economic and trends and this, you know, these are the times where you turn to your rabbis, your rebbitsons, you know, the mentors that you know, you know, Bloom is on the call, Yishai, Bruce, Cheryl, we've been on the trip and other things. This is the time where you turn to your mentors and we want you to know that we're here for everyone. Um, if it's nothing more than having this, you know, Zoom chat of every, providing a platform for people to connect. And then after it's, oh, it was great. Please, you know, call each other afterwards, connect. Um, we are here for you guys, and that's something very important that everyone everyone needs to know. Um, and that honestly, we've got the goods. You know, all the you know fluffy Hallmark greeting card type of wisdom that's nice and cute. But we have street creds. As I said before, we have three thousand three hundred thirty one years. That's just since Mount Sinai, but five hundred years before that to Abraham. We got thirty eight hundred years of how to deal with adversity, how to stay positive in the face of 
negative things that are happening. And my goodness, who else has come out smelling like a rose better than the Jewish people? You know, we were head to head with the Babylonians, the, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Visigoths, the Catholic Church, all of Europe, you know, many times. And we're here and we're here and we're leading the world. We, we didn't just, you know, stumble into 2020. We raced into it as a people. We are growing. We're vibrant. Torah is alive and well. And I think that's a really key message that um, we wanted to step up. We wanted to provide this platform uh, going forward. So um, just a couple public service announcements. Um, again, then officially we'll, we'll end in those people will stay on. Again, want to be sensitive to everyone's time. But um, so Sunday night, Rabbi Marcus is going to be giving, speaking of Pesach, Rabbi Marcus, please let us know what Sunday night's going to be on Project 613 Zoom channel here. Uh, hopefully based on how much time we have, but hopefully first class of maybe two or three classes based on demand on getting ready for Passover, because by the time Passover comes around, it's too late to try to figure it out as you're trying to deal with the Seder. And, um, you know, it makes the world of a difference to have a mindset with which to come into Passover versus just kind of stumbling upon it. Uh, beyond like toilet paper and hand sanitizer. And before you know it, there you are sitting at the Seder table. So that's, it's, it's shockingly not going to be about Corona, COVID-19 or anything related to that. Just Passover. It's just Torah, like Torah? Just Torah. Amazing, mind boggling. Okay, Sunday, what time, Rabbi? I think we said 7 p.m. Central time. Okay, great, 7 p.m. Central. Fantastic, and it's going to be a different Zoom link, I believe, because you have your own channel. Yes, and we figured 7 p.m. gives you enough time to get from your work at home to your class at home. <laughs> that was the idea. Okay, or your or your family uh, your family dinner to your uh, to your computer. Um, okay, so that's Sunday night, seven o'clock. Um, we are going to be going again next Wednesday as well. Um, this is sort of, I guess, the continuation of life seminar. Um, we, can I tell a bad joke? There's some joking in the back, can I do a little bit? That's not really a joke. But anyway, we were debating before all the classes shut down of what we're gonna do with life seminar. So we said, no, we're gonna go, we're gonna have, no matter what, we're going forward, we're gonna have class in person, and we were gonna rename it. Nice, Steve, look at, we're gonna rename it, Risk Your Life Seminar. Okay, come, come downtown, risk your life somewhere. I'm like, no, that, that's not appropriate. And then when it really, yes, there I know. Then what happened is when everything was canceled, we're going to rename it as Save Your Life Seminar. So this is definitely Save Your Life, your physical life and your spiritual life seminar. So we're going to be going next week, Wednesday. Don't exactly have the topic yet, but we will, we will have one. Okay, the other thing as well is uh, we sent out the email today we have an inordinate amount of resources. Rabbi Marcus and I both have a podcast. I don't know if anyone knows. We, um, I have a podcast every Sunday night, Monday, Monday Motivation, yes. And the three minute pump up, start your week with excitement. Rabbi Marcus's hits uh, all the channels on Thursday. It's a review of the weekly tour portion plus a very amazing insight. I know they're amazing insights because I use them at my own Shabbos table. Thank you, Rabbi, for your preparation, so I could take all the credit. Um, in addition, we're part of the larger Olami network. Olami is like the juggernaut of Jewish outreach. We are a proud, card-carrying member of Olami. They are literally having a field day with literally the biggest and best speakers on, in the Jewish world that are at your fingertips, okay? And Rabbi Marcus, the, the email, the, the website there is olami.org slash online. Online, okay. Olami, okay. Again, we could say, okay, Rabbi, could you put it in the chat? Doing that right now. Thank you. Um, okay. In addition, by the way, to one-on-ones, small group learnings. If you want to gather a buddy or two and say, hey, we want to learn about this topic, we will private Zoom things. If you want to learn one-on-one, -on -one, we are here for you, and we would love, love, love to do it. Okay. All right. I don't know if I'm missing anything. And then, okay. Uh, final thing is I, I really want to thank everyone for being here. I think we have a tremendous opportunity to show what it means to be Jewish, 
when could be the rest of the world is panicking. Um, we are the ones who have the belief that Hashem again runs the world, that he has a plan, that, um, that, he, that he has a plan, nothing's random. There is no room for panic. Um, and everyone's doing background things that are causing me to crack up. Gennady, thank you, Steve. Oh my goodness. World travel. How do you guys travel around the world? <laughs> okay. So I don't know if you're saying this, um, but we literally, we are the ones who taught the world to love your neighbors yourself. As Bruce said, his daughter, this is the time to be a giver, not to be a taker. This is the time to reach out to people. Even if you can't reach out in person to reach out by phone to show people that you're on some island that Steven's on or Gennady's in downtown Chicago on a blue sunny day. Gennady, the Rock of Gibraltar. Yak of Gibraltar. Jonas is by some train station. Okay, I don't know what else is going on over here. But these are some of the positive messages. It happens for a reason. God's sending us lemons. Let's make lemonade. And uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for, for joining. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi G. All right. Bye. You guys are awesome. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. -bye. All right. Everyone, Sunday night with Rabbi Marcus. And next good week. Good Zoom experience. Show. Really good one. Thank all you. right. John, you're looking great. Thank you all for being here.